very likely, I believe, uh, there will be fund flows back to Asia. Funds left Asia in the past 18 months because you know, U.S. hiking, rate, hiking, hiking rates, um, China is not doing well, the whole region has been dragged down you know, by COVID and so yeah. on. So market sentiment is now turning you know, less pessimistic at least and you know, going, moving towards uh, uh, optimistic about the growth in the region. We do believe that Asia growth is going to outperform developed market growth at least for this year. So based on that improvement in fundamentals, fund flows, I believe, will come back to Asia, benefits regional markets, and China, again, is a big positive factor in attracting fund flows back to the region. So there's a lot of positive, positive expectation for the fund flows to Asia during this year. I, I believe so. The economic uh, uh, benefits are going to help the fund flows come back here. Now, specifically to Asia and Southeast Asia region and Indonesia, obviously, how do you see the positioning and the attractiveness of Southeast Asia's region financial market compared to other peer countries in, let's say, Asian? Um, the, the region is quite diversified in terms of economic performance and, and financial performance. Uh, we have to look at you know, the um, economic fundamentals of each market. In general, the region is going to uh, benefit from the re reopening uh, of China more than the western part of the world. Because we are closer, Asia has much more trade with China, and the China-Asia uh, ASEAN uh, uh, economic relationship uh, is quite um, uh, integrated. So when China goes well, the, the region will go well. Uh, within the, the region, I believe um, you know, countries, for example, uh, Indonesia, we can look forward to probably stronger growth uh, momentum um, in Indonesia than some other um, peer countries here. Because when you look at bank credit growth in yeah. Indonesia, it's quite strong yeah. uh, for a few, months, uh, for a few yes. months already. So that is a sign of you know, business ex uh, investment expansion going forward, which in turn goes uh, all the way to support yeah. economic growth. So I think that is quite a, a big positive. Now, the other positive uh, for Indonesia in particular is oil, as I mentioned earlier, that you yeah. know, the China angle will benefit oil more, yeah. than, uh, more than other commodity products. And Indonesia is a net export, uh, exporter of oil. So obviously, yeah. from that angle, you know, um, uh, the market here will, will benefit um, uh, more than the, the peer countries uh, from the Chinese opening. That's nice that for Indonesia, you see, uh, you mentioned there's a lot of optimism. You know, if you see some macroeconomic variables, you know, the growth is still in the 5%, robust 5%. And then the inflation level is at 5% as well. And then there's a lot of, you know, positive sentiment from around the world where interest rate hikes cannot be super hawkish. And then it will translate to what Central Bank of Indonesia will do. Right. But then again, despite all of the optimism and despite all of the you know, good variables that we see in the macroeconomic sides of Indonesia, what are the things to anticipate as from Indonesia you know, to you know, just, there's a lot of challenge in the economic, economic global side. What are the things to anticipate as from the Indonesia side? Well, internationally, I think the, 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 the thing that Indonesia or the region uh, has to monitor is the change in the uh, central bank policy you know, in, in the developed markets. Right now, everybody is expecting peaking of uh, interest rate hikes yeah. by the central banks. But what about if the market is wrong? What about yeah. inflation comes back up again? Up again. So then the, the positive angles that we talked about earlier could reverse quickly and then money can get out of the region again. So, but that, that is not the, the, the base case right now. Uh, we are also looking at you know, gradual improvement. Uh, for Indonesia in particular, I think there is one big um, challenge that uh, investors, especially foreign investors, will look at. Indonesia as compared to the other uh, ASEAN or Asian countries, and that is the twin deficits of, of the country here, the fiscal yeah. deficit and the current account deficit. Um, that is you know, not a very strong economic fundamentals to attract funds, uh, at least not as the first destination for foreign investors to mm -hmm. look at. Yeah. But then that is one fundamental factor, and we have to square that with the other fundamental factors like you know, better growth uh, prospects and, yeah. and, and so on. You know, uh, uh, um, uh, other, other uh, fundamentals. So on the whole, I think uh, Indonesia compares quite well uh, with the peers in, in the region. Um, uh, and the, the, the oil anchor, I think, it, it really plays into Indonesia's advantage. But yeah, um, thank you so much for the optimism, you know, especially for Indonesian economy. But Mr. Chi, if, um, if I'm trying to, you know, grasping a lot of policy for the Fed, the interest rate hikes, you know, um, the inflation rate, in the United States is still at the level of 6.5%, but they have this target on, you know, putting the, the inflation right in the level of 2%. Yep. But the people, the market, already expecting a lot of interest rate cut 
Yeah. So what do you think about the expectation of it? Do you see the terminal rate of the, the fund rate or it's going to be there's a lot of adjustment going on as we see the inflation is still far away from 2%? Well, as, as things stand right now, I think the, the Fed Fund's terminal rate is around 5%, which is what the market expects. Now, it's, it's, it is true that U.S. Uh, US infl inflation and Europe inflation for the same uh, reason is it's coming down. Yeah. So the, the direction of inflation movement is correct. But then, as you mentioned earlier, that the actual inflation rate and the, the, the central bank target rate, there's still a big gap. Yeah. You know, from 6.5% down do to 2% think? is a, a long way. Yeah. Right? So we do need to see inflation come down towards uh, the, 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 tar the target inflation rate uh, quickly in order for the central bank, major, major central bank, to stop hiking rates. So if they come down only gradually, then what we can expect is that there's still going to be rate hikes, but smaller, not so frequent rate hikes until the actual Smaller, inflation. but not so frequent yeah. rate hikes. So like um, last year, the, the Fed hiked by, hiked by 75 basis points each time. But now we are looking at 50, 25 uh, uh, basis point hike each but time. But the terminal so, is still 5%. Terminal is still around 5%. So, you know, Fed funds rate, you know, movement from currently, uh, the real Fed funds rate is still less than 4%. So we need to see the real Fed funds rate go back up to the long-term average, which is about 1%. So that means there's still going to be rate hikes, but you know, smaller rate hikes. Instead of 75 basis points each time, we're looking at 25, something like that. Uh, but then this decline in inflation uh, movement is far from assured, especially from the Fed's perspective. Because mm. nobody, nobody knows whether you know, next month and month after they will go back up. <gasps> we, we've seen that happen in, in Europe. Uh, inflation com uh, numbers came out from Spain and France over the past two days sold uh, an unexpected take up. So that actually added to the ECB's hawkishness. Yeah. And the market is now expecting probably the ECB might be more hawkish than the Fed. Right? Things like this could change you know, quickly. And, and you know, th that's why we have to really monitor uh, the, the, the movement of the inflation rate at the same time, uh, compare that with the central bank um, uh, uh, target rate to, to gauge how quickly uh, the, the central bank's um, rate hike will peak. And how, um, if I would like to ask you, uh, can you give some, you know, closing remarks to set a tone of optimism for 2023 as we are, you know, starting this year with so many global bad news? How do you see, how do you want to put this 2023 forward, you know, setting a tone of optimism during so many challenges? I think it's good to be, you know, looking at the, the positive side. I've got a few observations here. Yeah. Uh, first, the COVID uh, situation it seems that stabilizing and the mutation of the virus, it seems that it's moving towards more deep benign. So if things don't get wrong, don't go wrong, and then the continue you know, mutation will just make COVID another flu. Right. So let's hope it goes that way. So that's COVID one positive. The other positive is the, uh, the Sino-US relations, that it seems that we are seeing some signs that the two countries, China and the US, are, are trying to stabilize the relations yeah. or, or even move to, to warm up relations. Yeah. You know, uh, um, uh, Secretary Blinken is visiting China uh, this weekend, Meeting. and then later on, uh, Yellen, a uh, uh, treasury, is, right. is going to go to China as well. So it seems that the two countries are, are, are willing to talk more. I think that is already one big positive. Yeah. That they talk more, uh, they, they, they tell each other the, the red lines, and, and they understand each other more. Yeah. Uh, so that, that could help right. market sentiment. Uh, and last uh, but not least, uh, hopefully the central bank policy uh, expectation that you know, rate hike will peak soon, that will we'll continue and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get an, an easier financial environment later this year into next year.